Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I should be free to do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting somebody else. Kind of a popular mindset, popular attitude out there today, isn't it? I mean, if, if I want to watch 10 hours of football on a Sunday afternoon, then you know, I should be able to do that because it's not hurting anyone for me to watch football. Or if I want to eat McDonald's every day for every meal for a month, I should be able to do that as long as it's not hurting somebody else, right? I want to be able to, to do the things that I want to do, see who I want to see, go where I want to go, and it all shouldn't matter as long as I'm not, not inflicting bodily harm on another person. Now our, our freedom-loving, independent American spirit uh, looks at that attitude and kind of says, you know, I, I can get on with that. I agree with that. But then as a Christian, we, we look at a statement like this and we have to say, isn't there something more? Isn't there something more to life than just trying to avoid hurting other people? I mean, isn't there room to try and make a positive difference? I mean, isn't there room for things like love and compassion and care and concern for other people, that, the kind that goes far beyond just not wanting to see them be harmed? Well, in the Bible section that we're going to look at today from Luke chapter 17, Jesus makes the case that there is that there is much more to our life than just wanting to avoid harming people. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. And there it says, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you is a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants and we have only done our duty. And this is God's word. Uh, so as we begin to look into this section of the Bible, uh, the key to understanding the opening thought of Jesus is that phrase, things that cause people to stumble. Uh, it's a loaded phrase. It's one that we're going to have to unpack a bit. So if you're walking along a pathway, you know, a non-paved pathway, what kind of things in that path are going to cause you to stumble? Maybe if there's a rock or a root or a branch that's sticking out of the soil, you hit your foot on that branch and you stumble, you trip, maybe even you completely fall over. But when this word's used in the Bible, uh, it's almost always used in the sense of somebody who stumbles, trips, falls in their walk with God. So then we have to ask, well, what is it that causes a person to stumble, to trip, to fall in their walk with God? Well, there's only one thing. It's sin. So then something that causes people to stumble then is something that leads them to sin or, or even worse than that, something that leads them to turn away from God altogether. And so Jesus says that this sort of thing, these things that cause people to stumble, that they're bound to happen in life. They're bound to come because we live in a world that's filled with sinful people. They're bound to come because each one of us has a sinful nature that lives inside of us. And they're bound to come because we always have the devil whispering his lies into our ear. So of course... There will be things in this world, there will be things in our lives that lead people to sin. Jesus says it's unavoidable. And that fact by itself is bad enough. But there's something worse than that, Jesus says. Uh, he goes on to say, But woe to anyone through whom these things that cause people to stumble come. And it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone that's a large rock tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus there strongly warns against 
being the one who casts one of these stumbling blocks into the path of somebody else, particularly before uh, one of these little ones, as Jesus says. Now, little ones, it can refer to people who are little in regard to age, like children. It can also pe refer to people who are little in their Christian faith, you know, learning about Jesus, haven't been a Christian for a very long time, or still growing in their knowledge. It can also mean those who are little or unimportant in the eyes of the world. Now, if we try to answer which one of these is Jesus talking about, I would say we don't need to limit it to any one of these because in the eyes of Jesus, every life matters. In the eyes of Jesus, every soul is important. No matter who that soul belongs to, no matter how unimportant the world might say that that life is. So that's why Jesus says, watch yourselves. Make sure you don't do this. He, he's warning us to be careful about the way that our words and the way that our actions affect the people around us. You see, he wants us to be concerned and not just for what we do, but he wants us to be concerned about how the things we do, the impact that it'll have on others. So certainly, yeah, there's more to life than just trying to avoid harming them. And so, yeah, while there are many ways that we can put a stumbling block in somebody else's path, Jesus, in this section, he cautions against one specific scenario. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. First thing to notice there, Jesus is talking about our relationships with other Christians. He says, if your brother or sister sins. That term, brother or sister, used in the New Testament, it's to describe the family-type relationship that believers in Christ share with one another. So then, in our relationships with other Christians, Jesus is giving us a warning on one hand. A warning against being too tolerant of sin and a warning against being too intolerant of sin. He says, if they sin, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive. So taking a closer look at, look at this then, if someone sins against you, Jesus says to rebuke them. Just a simple direction to rebuke is to express disapproval of a person's words or actions. So what he's telling us to do here is if someone sins against you, to just go and talk to them about it. Maybe that person doesn't even realize what's happened. Or maybe they do realize what's happened and just need to be told, this is not okay. Either way, though, it doesn't have to be a big production. It's just one Christian friend going to another and saying, when you say that, it hurts. Please stop. But Jesus doesn't say to ignore the problem, to pretend it doesn't happen. He doesn't say to sweep it under the rug. Uh, at the same time, Jesus does not say that when someone sins against you to, to be passive aggressive against them, you know, to try and make them figure out what exactly they did against you. And finally, Jesus does not say to go and blab to all your friends about what happened. He doesn't say to do any of these. He just says to rebuke them. And he says to rebuke them because this sin has caused a separation to take place, a separation between you and that other individual. That's always what sin does. Sin always separates. It always divides. But even worse than causing a division between you, it's caused a division between that person and God. And the only way for that gap to be closed is to deal with the sin directly. And all those other things, ignoring it, passive-aggressive, gossiping about it, none of them deal with the sin. None of them close the division. In fact, they probably only serve to make it worse. And so failing to rebuke someone then is, is a way of casting a stumbling block into their path. So Jesus says, if someone sins against you, just rebuke them. So that's the warning against being overly tolerant of sin. But then Jesus comes with another warning of being overly intolerant. He says, if they repent, forgive them. That is, you know, if they listen to you and if they say something that sounds kind of like, I'm sorry, then to go ahead and forgive them. Now, the picture in the word forgive is to send it away. And so when you forgive someone a sin, what you do is you take the debt of guilt that's been created between you because of the sin, you take the hard feelings that you might have, you take the desire to make them pay for what they've done, you take all of that and you send it away. You make it as if this sin, this whole thing, never even happened. That's what it means to forgive. And Jesus attaches no conditions to the forgiveness. He doesn't say here, you know, if they grovel and beg and plead for 15 minutes on their knees, tears in the eyes, then forgive them. No, he doesn't do that. Nor does he say, you know, if they come to you, then make them squirm. Make them wonder. Make them really question whether or not they can be forgiven. Nor does he say, 
do it only if you think they're really sincere. And finally, he doesn't say, if the sin is too great, if it's too big, don't forgive them at all. He just says, if they repent, forgive them. No questions asked. And then on top of that, he says, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, forgive them. His point here is quite simple. It's to keep on forgiving no matter how many times it happens. You see, being too tolerant of sin, when we fail to rebuke, that leads people to think that they don't need God's grace and they don't need his forgiveness. But at the same time, being overly intolerant of sin leads people to think that maybe God can't forgive them or that it can never be good enough, or they can never be taken back, or what they've done can never be wiped away. And so both of these, being too tolerant and being too intolerant, places a stumbling block before people. And that's why Jesus speaks so harshly. Jesus wants all people to hear God's word. He wants all people to know God's word and to know his grace. And so that's why he speaks harshly about casting stumbling blocks. You see, it's, it's entirely one thing. It's bad enough to impede your own walk with God, to say, I'm going to choose the path of sin rather than the path of righteousness, but it's something different entirely to do that to somebody else. And so if we look at the things that we say and the things that we do, if we look at the way we handle it when somebody sins against us, I think we can see that every single one of us has cast our share of stumbling blocks in the paths of others, haven't we? Whether it's through failing to rebuke and love and instead choosing the path of ignoring or passive, being passive-aggressive or, or gossiping about it, or whether it's being slow to forgive or even withholding that forgiveness altogether, we're the ones who deserve that millstone to be tied around our neck. But friends, in spite of that, that's not how God sees it anymore. In Jesus Christ, God actually forgives you and me for all of our stumbling blocks. He forgives you and me no matter how many times in a single day we come to him and sin against him. No matter how many times in a single day we go back to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up again. I did that same thing that I know has been wrong, that same thing that I've been, I did it again. He still forgives you. He forgives you in the same way that he calls you to forgive other people. You see, God never asks you to do anything that he hasn't already done for you. And so God forgives you wholly and completely because Jesus died for all of your sins on a cross. There, in a sense, you could say Jesus took that millstone that you and I deserved and he let himself be, let himself be cast into the sea of God's judgment in our place. And because Jesus did that, that's why we're forgiven. And see, God wants all people to know of this full and free forgiveness that he gives in Jesus Christ and he wants all people to have it. And that's why he warns us against casting stumbling blocks in the way of other people. Now, when these first disciples who heard Jesus, you know, say this stuff about rebuking and forgiving, they were pretty intuitive. They were pretty attentive. They recognized something about it. And it was really hard to do. It's hard to go to somebody who sinned against you and to say, no, that hurts. Please stop. It's hard when somebody's hurt you to forgive them. And so that's why they said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. They were saying that to be able to do these things that Jesus had asked, they needed more faith to be able to do that. But Jesus' response to them, it's quite powerful. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So now the mustard seed, it was the smallest of all the seeds to be planted in the ground. You can see it, it's right there in the palm of the hand, that little bitty seed there. His point with talking about faith the size of a mustard seed, is to say that anyone who has faith has at least that much faith. At least faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, compare that to the mulberry tree. The mulberry tree was a tree that was known for its deep, deep root systems. Uh, You didn't just uproot a mulberry tree. Uh, You didn't do it with tools, let alone by command. It was impossible. And so Jesus' point here is quite simple, that even with the smallest amount of faith that we can imagine, that is enough to do what would otherwise be impossible for us. And so then his point to those disciples who said, Lord, increase our faith, was to say, you guys already have enough faith to do which I have asked you to do. You don't need to wait for more. Through faith the size of a mustard seed, God can lead you to rebuke someone in sin, and God can lead you to forgive them. Now the implication for us here is that there is no task that God lays out in his word 
that we are unable to carry out. You see, through faith the size of a mustard seed, God can also lead you to rebuke someone who's in a sin. Through faith the size of a mustard seed, God can lead you to forgive no matter how badly that person has hurt you. Through faith the size of a mustard seed, God can lead you to be concerned for others and to be generous with everything we have. Through faith the size of a mustard seed, God can lead you and me to be so concerned for others that we vigilantly watch ourselves, that we don't put anything in their path that would cause them to sin or lead them away. Yes, through faith the size of a mustard seed, you can do it all. Because as the Bible says elsewhere, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And Christ strengthens me through that faith, even faith as small as a mustard seed. So then how do we look at it when you know, we start to actually do these things, these hard things that, that we would otherwise think to be impossible? How do we look at it when we start to talk to someone about their sin or even more to, to say, I forgive them, even when they've hurt us? That's what Jesus gets at with his comparison with the servant and the master at the end of our text. See, the question there is, does the servant deserve special recognition for simply doing what he's expected to do? Of course not. It's the servant's job to care for the animals. It's the servant's job to prepare the meal. He doesn't deserve special recognition for doing his job. So then in the same way, Jesus says that when you and I do the things that God expects us to do in his word, that we shouldn't expect special treatment and we shouldn't expect praise in return for it. Instead, we should see it as just doing what we're supposed to do. So speaking, he's speaking toward our attitude about serving God. We don't serve God to be praised. We don't serve God to be thanked. We don't serve God to be noticed. And we don't serve him to somehow put God into our debt to make him owe us something, not at all. Instead, serving, caring, forgiving, rebuking, all of it is just what we're supposed to do to be doing as children of God. As Jesus says at the end, we have only done our duty. Now this attitude, it runs contrary to our human nature, doesn't it? Being a human being, what do we crave? We crave approval. We want people to say, good job. We crave recognition. We want the boss to point the finger at, at, our, at ourselves and to say, that person does a great job. We crave accolades and words of gratitude so then how can we have such a humble mindset that says, you know, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do? Well, that mindset comes only by faith in Jesus Christ. And again, even a mustard seed worth of that faith. You see, by faith in Jesus, not only are, are all of your sins forgiven, they are, but at the same time, you're also given credit, credit for the perfect life that Jesus lived. So all of the accolades, all of the praise, all the recognition that Jesus earned, that Jesus deserved, uh, not from human beings, but from God, all of that is yours simply by faith in him. It's been credited to you. So what that means then is that you don't need to worry about your good deeds getting noticed and getting recognized because before God, you already have a perfect record because Jesus' perfect record is credited to you. You don't need God to notice how good you are, to notice how many good things you do in life, because by faith in Jesus, eternity and all of its blessings are already yours, no matter how many good things you do. You see, you can't make God smile on you more than he already does by faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, though we are unworthy servants, our God chooses to call us something else, something better. He chooses to call us his perfect children. And as perfect children of God, concern for others, particularly concern for their soul, yeah, that's our duty. And so we watch ourselves. We watch ourselves to make sure that we don't lead other people into sin or even worse, away from God. We watch ourselves so that when a fellow Christian does sin against us, we rebuke them, but we do it in a spirit of humility and of gentleness, recognizing that before God, I am no less guilty of sin than that person is. But then when that sinner turns and repents, we forgive them just in the same way God has forgiven us wholly and completely. And see, God empowers us to do all of this by faith in Jesus Christ. And even the smallest amount of faith is enough, is a large enough channel for God's power to work through it to enable you to do that which he asks. And then finally, when we do do those things that he asks us, uh, we do them not to earn special favor or recognition, but we do it simply because it's our duty. So yeah, there is a whole lot more to life than just wanting other people to not get hurt. You know, we want to show concern for their soul, care for their soul. We want to help them along the path to life and righteousness. So God, help us to grow in our connection to Christ so that through him, we grow in our concern for other people. 
and then also grow in our desire to care for them, to serve them, and to watch out for them uh, that we all join together in our heavenly home. Amen.